we are recording as of right now. I just want to make sure you know we've had some preliminary chat. I'm, I'm talking, talking with uh, flutist Deborah Silvert, uh, flute, alto flute, piccolo, and a very interesting instrument. I don't want to give it away just yet. We're going to talk about that, that you have a special relationship with. Uh, and guitarist Paul Bowman. Um, we're speaking uh, more or less, we're going to talk about a lot of things, very important things, I think, anyway, about your lives, about what this whole thing is that you have just reinitiated, maybe I can say. We're talking about uh, the duo Sequenza. We're looking at duo Sequenza here. Again, flutist Deborah Silver, guitarist Paul Goldman. Uh, the CD is a 2019 Novona Records release, and they are so wonderful. Uh, I'll put up on my website, uh, performingartsreview.net, all the links to buy the CD, to read the program notes. I mean, Novona is really, really good about that. The album is called Yes, It's a Thing! Exclamation point. And when you see the CD title every uh, cover, everybody, you'll understand. Uh, yes, it's a thing, all right. And it took me a long time. In fact, I think, Deborah, you had to coach me uh, over one of our previous telephone calls before I finally saw that what this thing <laughs> was oh, on, the, on the CDs. Okay, let, let's, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, flutist Deborah Silver founded Duo Sequenza uh, with guitarist Paul uh, Bowman in 1988. And there's a little dot, dot, dot. There's things we're going to talk about, about the ups and downs of career and family and intercessions and whatever stuff that happens. Um, uh, taught you, you uh, Deborah, taught flute uh, from 94 to 99 at Val Valparaiso. I'm supposed to say Valparaiso, Indiana University, not Valparaiso. Uh, Valparaiso, Indiana University. Uh, Paul, you are you received your master's degree in, in guitar from Manhattan School of Music, and you are working uh, at finishing your DMA, if I understand correctly, at UC San Diego, and we'll give we'll talk about that a little bit about dissertations and uh, recitals that are all those requirements about the, the uh, uh, DMA that that uh, you know ba basically not a whole lot of people go eh maybe next lifetime you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, th th those are the people I'm talking to, um, you know, because it's it's just a question that uh, I have lots and lots and lots of musicians, professional musicians and amateur musicians and friends and neighbors and all the rest of it out there. But the, but all of us, myself included, we all want to know what it is because we all know what it was for ourselves. But what was the moment? Let's start with Deborah. What was it? When? How old were you when all of a sudden it was like flute? Bingo. Go. <laughs> I didn't really want to play the flute. I wanted to play the harp. The harp, that was what I wanted to play. But, you know, I was, when we started um, instruments, it was only, I was only in second grade in my particular school system. The harp was completely out of the question. You know, very, very expensive. They, did, they weren't even offering it anyway. But the shiny flute, you know, that shiny, that shiny thing. I wanted to play the shiny thing. Oh, that thing. Go ahead, sorry. That thing, that thing, the shiny one. And um, so I was, a pretty challenging child and I insisted my mom buy that flute you know the other kids were rent the parents were renting it you know we were second graders you know what did we know but I wanted I wanted I wanted to own it and I insisted that she buy it, it was probably a very good thing because um, I don't know if I ever re really would have gotten back to it because in the second grade I lasted for all of six weeks and <laughs> and that was the end of that and um, also, oh, then the flute kind of went into the went, went into the front closet and. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It came out periodically, and you know, I would mess around with it, but I didn't had no clue what I was doing. And um, when I started running away from home, I was a juvenile delinquent. When I started running away from home, I took the flute with me. Stop. We, we, she very casually just mentioned that, and um, I, I knew this, but I think that we're, we're going to, let's, Deborah, let, uh, Paul, if you can wait for just a moment, let's do this one. Then we'll talk about Paul and his problems. <laughs> but, but the, the, you know, you and I have spoken, Deborah, about, about this, and what we're going to be getting at here is that you luckily had that flute with you, that you were, you, you were uh, shall we say, kind of a, maybe a problematic kid or something you know you you ran away from home you were unhappy of whatever circumstances you don't need to go with that one but that that flute was there and taught tell me tell all of us about it that instrument was an anchor was a savior what i think i was going to pawn it <laughs> honestly <laughs> I think. thanks you just shattered my whole fantasy <laughs> but um you know fortunately 
definitely. I um, after running away three times, and I ran long distance. We're talking um, 14, think, 15 years old. Uh, 15, so. yeah, 15, 15 years old. I finally got into a foster home, and the foster family was musical. So they, um, they, and they were very fond of me. I was very fond of them. They wanted to pay for private lessons for me, and they set me up with an excellent teacher. Um, and I, I just took off like a, wow. like a shot. Yeah. Wow. I had nothing else to do. I had to switch schools. You know, that's very hard to do at, at 15. Oh, sure. I know, I knew no one in the, in the new school. So, were you know, you really, but I did with my time. I practiced. I practiced. Were, were you in a small town or a large town? Where, where were um, you? it was, a, it, these were suburbs of Buffalo, New York. Suburbs of Buffalo. Yeah. yeah okay. Suburbs of Buffalo. I went from one suburb to a different suburb, no, <laughs> but no, I actually no. studied the, the first, the first teacher I had was Cheryl Gabetti. Um, she's since passed away. She was a flutist in the with the Buffalo Philharmonic at the time, and um, yes. you know, so I had an excellent. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. You got lucky, Paul. What happened? Any any good news? Bad news? What? When was the first sort of thing that made guitar suddenly speak to you as a, as as your uh, mm -hmm. special instrument? Yeah, growing up in this area, we had uh, we had the the Indiana Dunes, which is a beautiful uh, natural. Uh, uh, playground uh, where people go and, and s scale the really large sand dunes and swim in Lake Michigan in the summer. And uh, it's a national park now. So growing up there, uh, bonfires and, you know, beer keggers with friends bring the guitar and, and you first, go. you know, 11, 12, we played uh, you know, and then school uh, in in my small town uh, was the the outlet f for my musical uh, endeavors. We had a great uh, music director and and uh, had a jazz band, and I and I excelled initially with the jazz guitar. And it wasn't until uh, I was 14 or 15 or so that I saw Andre Segovia in Chicago downtown Chicago. Uh, do it. And, uh, so uh, that really turned me around. And then the catharsis for me was, again, uh, when I was 16, I, I had a diving accident where I broke the fifth cervical vertebrae uh, almost all the way through up to a millimeter, and uh, I could have been quadriplegic. So I certainly took music very seriously after that. and. Um, uh, so I, I was going along parallel tracks with jazz guitar. Uh, we had a great jazz big band in my high school, and we used to compete in festivals, and I would uh, go and win Best Soloist Awards. But at the same time, I, I was working on classical. I would take lessons in Chicago, uh, get on the South Shore train, uh, which is, you will know, we'll, Talk about, talk about the South that. Shore. I was going to say, we're going to talk about South Shore. And uh, it's an electric uh, commuter train that connects South Bend to Chicago. And uh, from my home in the dunes, uh, we uh, I went on some Saturday, most Saturdays, I'd go uh, study with Richard Pick. Richard Pick in Chicago was the, uh, the mafioso of guitar. Uh, he would write uh, in his method book. He had his own method books. He insisted you do everything in uh, his way. And he wrote in his book, uh, save for the right hand thumb, that's the boss, you know, and he said it in a gangster kind of style. <laughs> and uh, they just write or I'll whack you. Yeah, I play it with the thumb, or he's the boss here. And so, uh, but no, Richard Pick, very, very respectable guitarist. Perhaps a bit arrogant. There are stories about him, but in any case, uh, he his students have gone on, and our our professors uh, for guitar have been many years at Northwestern University, for instance, and at DePaul University. Those are his pupils from the 70s, whenever it was that I studied. They're about my age. So, but in any case. Um, uh, as I went to jazz, I went to jazz school in, in Berkeley School of Music in Boston, and uh, was one of 700 guitar majors. So that didn't that didn't last long. I just stayed three semesters, and I kept uh, advancing uh, on the classical guitar. And, and after a while, I pushed the jazz guitar in the corner and just focused on classical. And 
and got it accepted uh, at the Manhattan School of Music. And um, so not, then that I. That ain't bad. Yeah, it was it was really uh, you know hard work initially. Is and, you know Deborah can attest to when you're first learning, you you have so much that for me I growing up in this area in Indiana, I, I initially never had any guitar teachers until I started taking lessons in Chicago. And, and so there's just so much to learn. And um, so and, I was- And maybe fortunate. even um, just to speak about uh, being self-taught at a certain level, maybe even both of you fooling around with the flute or playing with the guitar, at a certain point, you make the decision and then the hard stuff begins. You have to you have to have people tell you how to how to unlearn certain things, yeah. certain bad things. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. So it, I just remembered a funny little thing. I remember at one point early on that my goal was to be a mediocre flutist. <laughs> I just wanted to play well enough to be sort of mediocre. That sounds like me and clarinet actually. <laughs> I just wanted to be a second clarinetist. I was yeah, happy in that mid range. I didn't want any of that high, tough, high, difficult stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that. You know, there are things to be said about <laughs> about cho choosing mediocrity, as it were. Well, what here? Let's let's skip the subject ahead a couple ticks and look look at uh, Sequenza. When, when did you two meet each other? How did it begin? Stuff like that. I mean, go. Who well, I, I I moved back uh, from New York uh, in the in '88. Um, I was in New York for about eight years. Uh, five of them were at Manhattan School, where, where I got the bachelor's and master's in classical guitar. And then the three were, you know, the struggle of living in New York and was very difficult and. Um, you know, certainly I had music jobs, and and, and I got to play uh, in in new music uh, ensembles that of through contacts I developed at Manhattan School of Music. But in any case, I I was floundering. It just wasn't wasn't uh, productive enough for me, and it was a struggle to survive. So I moved, uh, you know, back home, the proverbial prodigal son returning home, and. Oh yeah, uh, all my of this parents, is way too familiar for me. Go ahead. Yeah, parents, parents were too enthused. Uh, but uh, you know, so Deborah and I, we 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 uh, met. Um, I I'm not sure how I found her contact number. You, you found number. me. Yeah, I don't. I, I, you I, you were. I, he was asking around, and I had just. Maybe, I think in '87. I asked gotten onto Phil the... Molinar, Molinar Music. Oh, maybe. There was a music, local, yeah, there music, was a local store, music store, and I asked, hey, is there a flute player? And then they gave me your name. Yeah. So. I, now, had where, where the, I had just gotten on the Indiana. 88, 1988. 88. And what town was this again? This is part of what else? Valparaiso. Okay, so right, a small city, right? right? Valparaiso yeah. is a small town. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me see if I understand this right, because it becomes, in my mind, even more interesting uh, to, to me. Uh, let me see if I get this right. Paul, uh, you know, and not for this big city stuff. I can't make a living. You know what I mean? It's tough. Rent is impossible. I'm gonna go home and cool, chill for a bit. You you come home to Valparaiso. Stop me if when I'm wrong. And you get a little itch or something. Uh, maybe to, is there anybody? Maybe I can play, make some music with. And you start asking around town. Is there a flutist? Am I close? Uh, yeah, it was probably. The, the one of the first impulses actually because um, you worked a lot with flute in New York. I you? worked a lot with flute and I and I just uh, I don't know I just I, I knew that that there was an, a, a duo type of duo that I wanted to form and and, and find uh, you know to, you always if you're from a new place and you're coming back uh, you you always want to find out who's around and who the players are and, and that's what I did and I, and I found her but um, I lived in a town called I grew up in a town called Chesterton which is just about 12 miles north of Valparaiso uh, Chesterton is on Lake Michigan and, and Valparaiso is just Still south, south yeah. it's in the same county it's just the middle of the county and I, I grew up in the north part of the county but in any case um, yeah that's where my parents lived and, and they let me back uh, you know <laughs> tail between the legs kind of thing but no I oh, yes, I, I, was able to, I, I know these things I know what he's yeah saying. but I it was it Thank was God very for parents 
Yeah, I know. It what, was very, what's very productive for us initially because uh, I wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like, okay, you're home and go get a job, buddy. You know, my parents weren't as insistent on that. as right. So I, my That's job nice. initially with her, uh, would I, I would spend days and days, you know, day after day, you know, 10 hours, 12 hours at her house. We would rehearse, we, we, we would uh, do bookings, we would, we would promote the old, fa the old, old fashioned, old fashioned way, way with, a word, right, yeah. with a word processor and sending, you know, a whole bunch of paper resumes and, 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 and brochures, brochures and bulk mailing, bulk and, mailing all that and cost, all that stuff incredible and cost, envelopes. Yeah. And I did that when I lived in New York, I worked for several uh, new music groups that, that had uh, non-for-profit status and they would get the bulk mailing and, and uh, I, I helped the work in the office. So I, I was pretty familiar with this kind of work, but in the old days, you know, you would get a list from, say, Arts Midwest. You would get a list of presenters. I mean, it would be a thick on that old computer paper that used to come out. Uh, with the holes uh, on the side. With the yeah. holes yeah. on yeah. the side, the perforated holes. And so you would get, like, a list of, of who the, the contact people at colleges, universities. This was before College Music Society like got their act together and started publishing, you know, for jobs. But those are for teaching jobs at College Music Society. But they do publish a uh, big index of, of universities with music programs and list all the faculty and what music they've had. But in any case, this was old fashioned, you well, know, let me, let me, leather, let me just, let me jump call, in. follow up, phone call, yeah. you know. The old way of trying to book let, let me just, so uh, we book our own tours, basically. Let me, let me jump in, which is that it sounds like we're talking about 100 years ago, and it was only <laughs> maybe 20. And believe me, I'm an administrator. I've been doing this all my life, too, putting together, putting together the mailing. That we're, one, now I just do email lists. I don't bother with the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, there's no such thing I mean, anymore. You, there's no point at all, but I remember well those times. We're past us there. We, but but let me ask this question. I'm, I'm having this fantasy. I have no idea what, what, uh, what uh, Valparaiso looks like, but I'm imagining a, a little Midwestern, charming little Midwestern, very quiet little there's town. There's a, a famous uh, Lutheran university It's a university. Here. Here. Oh, it's oh. sort of a Hulkburg. Of, of Lutheran uh, uh, academia is right here in this makes, town. It makes sense being in Indiana too. The Lutherans, uh, you know, the the various immigrations. And, and yeah, so. I mean, it's great too. There are a bunch of Germans here, and I, since I live in Germany, I seek them out and I try to, you know, have conversations but with them. What I want to know is so 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 what I'm imagining is so Deborah's walking down the the, the main street or something, minding her own business, doing a window shot, a little window shopping, and somebody says, hey, somebody wants to talk to you about, I mean, what, were, or were you are, are actually also kind of looking to see, we're talking about 1988, right, or in 88? Right, I was, I, I was on the, the blue, I was, yeah, I, I think he called blue. me, I think he telephoned me, I was on the, um, at the time, the State Arts Commission, Indiana Arts Commission, and many of the other states had a, a presenter touring roster. Sure, yep. Like there was a juried, um, you know, artist roster. Yep. And so I was on that artist roster, and I was uh, just doing solo recitals. And um, I didn't, I didn't even know that flute and classical guitar was a thing. I didn't know that was a thing. Dude, <laughs> you know, I mean. Now you know where yes, it's a thing. I was, I was, you know, I was trained for chamber 30 music. 30 years later. But, right, uh, exactly. I was yes, trained for chamber music, but you know, um, I was very into woodwind quintet and I was very into flute and piano and, you know, sonata duos. And um, that's what I was doing. I, I was, I was a little more traditional. I wasn't doing as much new music. I, you know, I was doing like, you know, kind of um, the, you know, the entire. Wow, or something. Uh, yeah, I mean everything from, you know, all the way back to Marais, Marin and Marais, um, you know, all the way up to, you know, contemporary stuff. Nuchinsky was still living at the time, um, and Density, Varez, you know, different things like that. Um, but I. I think I got the call out of the blue. I, I mean, I remember. Was, I remember it as being a phone call, and he and he and he said it was so interesting because he says um, he introduced himself. 
um, he said he was a classical guitarist, um, wondered whether I might be interested in forming a flute and classical guitar duo with him. He says, I know you don't know me, but you know, I grew up in Chesterton. I have my bachelor's in Man and master's from the Manhattan School. And I have a personal letter of recommendation from Lucas Foss and also from, you just know. Just drop from, a name or two. Yeah, just drop a name or two. Just Elliot Carter. <laughs> Charles Warren. Yeah, Charles Warren and Roger Reynolds. You know, just some small names. Yeah. <laughs> and I that. thought, boy, and he wants to play with me, you know. But I, you know, I had long left the mediocrity behind. I'd been doing a lot of young artist competitions and things until I got too old for those. And then, um, you know, I took it, I, I just took it, you know, I just kept on that path of four to five. I started practicing four to five hours a day and I just never stopped. So oh, and that's that what's was, required. I mean, no yeah. kidding. That really is what's required. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, so there you go. So you have your first rehearsal, two strangers. Yeah, first rehearsal, and we and I remember Actually, what we did. We, had we worked a concert on, like in, in January, in January '89. Six, six weeks later. Six weeks I think we had was. our first concert. Mm -hmm. We planned, yeah. But the first pieces he brought, he brought Robert Beezer's Il est né, Le Devant Enfant, and he also brought Joan Towers' Snow Dream, so, yeah, two, which he had done. I I don't even think he it had been published when Paul did it. Yeah, I York. had notes. Uh, Joan Towers personal notes. Uh, she wrote it for my teacher, who was uh, Sharon Isbin. Uh, she wrote it for her and Carol Winsons. Carol Winsons. And Carol, 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 of course, um, She she's from Buffalo originally, Carol Winsons. Yeah, she also world. studied, yeah, very small world. She studied also with my first teacher, Cheryl Gavetti. It was her, was one of her early teachers, yeah. Okay, so you got together. This, I'm trying to get, get this story clear. You got together, you played some concerts. Now what happened and the, or did it am I incorrect something it the things stopped at a certain point yes there's there has been a gap right tell me about there was a gap what happened why and the gap because I think most of us are gonna say oh yeah that happened who wants to start well, it was <laughs> Paul married this opera singer Oh, that'll do it every time yeah every time and she got a job at an opera house in Germany and so he followed her over there. But at the same time, I had, we had adopted, my husband and I had adopted one child, a son, and he was actually going on tour with us, um, nice. probably the first 14 months of his life, but then we adopted a second child, my oldest daughter, and she had special needs, lots of intense special needs. And so that was very concurrent with his getting married and moving um, it just kind it of makes perfect sense that, that, yeah, that, that it just, you know you both went had your keep happening. We, we we had some concerts on the books and we just split them um, you know he he took you know what he could finish up I took what I could you know yeah. manage because we just couldn't you know couldn't keep going so, so things were start where things started 88 89 things are starting to cook and percolate they, yeah and, and they wound down in 93 93, 93. was the Wow. So it just almost yeah. began to take flight, and then things happen. Somebody gets married and goes off to Germany. Something happens about your children and special needs and becoming needing to become a mom. Uh, okay, so there's all that, yeah. and all those years go by. Did you co correspond with each other? Was there any? Not at thing? all. Not at all. Uh, yeah, I don't know why we didn't. I, I, I it wasn't. I don't remember feeling animosity or anything. I think it I just, think we just lost touch. We just I mean, simply, yeah. I, I mean, mean, I was at Paul's wedding. You know, I remember the wedding, yeah, and and I and, and then, then I I heard. You know, he I heard that they were moving to Germany, and I think we might have. I don't remember specifically. I think we might have talked or gotten together. We weren't going to try to do anything as a duo. You couldn't book it. I mean, we couldn't, you know, we just didn't know what we were doing. I, you know, my, with my two little kids and the one having special needs, it was just, you know, not good. It's called and, too much. Yeah, it was just, just too much. much. And, 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 and uh, you know, I just, I don't know. And, and part of it for me, it was very painful. I, I didn't get the university teaching job until 95. And so that was good for me as an art, you know, I had that artistic outlet. I was able to do faculty recitals, and I and and I, I did. I generally would do one solo faculty recital, and then a couple chamber music recitals with other faculty members per year. I was maybe doing three a year, which was way down from the 15 or 20 that we used to do way back when. Um, but 
and, and that went until 99. So that was, it was satisfying, but yet I had a really heavy teaching load and I had my kids at home and I wasn't able to practice that four to five hours a day like I loved to do. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I don't know, we just, Paul and I just lost touch. I mean, there were a couple times that I, I thought to Google him, you know, once the internet became a thing. <laughs> and um, I don't I don't know that I ever found him out there. I, I think I might have found a YouTube video once. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. And um, yeah. So, so it's, all gone, it's all gone. You, you figure nothing, maybe both of you are just, you're just not even thinking in terms of getting back together. What brought oh, you back no, together? Oh no, that wasn't even, that wasn't even a, th I, that wasn't even a thought. It wasn't even the thought. In fact, I didn't, I, um, when we remodeled, I wasn't even teaching after 1999 when I left the university. I was just too busy with my family. And um, my husband, when we were remodeling a part of the house that we're in now, he wanted to build a music room. And I said, boy, that seems kind of silly. I don't, you know, what do I need a music room for? I don't, I don't even practice anymore. I'm not teaching. He said, no, you need to have a music room. So he built a music room. It's not really huge um but maybe he was a little you know prescient too that he yeah, a little. Was feeling that maybe i'd come back but in 2014 i the flute convention we have a national association national flute association um and every year they have a, a big convention and it was held in chicago in 2014 so because it was in chicago i thought oh i really want to go so i my husband says, well, go, you should go. I mean, I built you a so, music room, go. Right, I'm used, right, exactly, he's always been very supportive. Well, I didn't even, I felt awkward even reaching out to any of my flutist colleagues because I'd been out of that world for so long. It just, you know, I mean, 14 years, no one had seen or heard from me. And um, so I just asked them to set me up with a roommate and they set me up with a wonderful Dutch flutist that was uh, premiering some Catherine Hoover works at the convention. And her name is Vendela Wenswall, and she teaches now at the Cordoba Conservatory in Spain. And she and I became very good friends. It turned out that she, we have the same flute maker, and we have the same fondness for Catherine Hoover, so no accidents. And I was very shy. We, we brought both of our flutes from our, from our common maker, and she wanted to play mine. Mine was a very early flute. It was number 108 and she had a 600 and something flute and so she wanted to play 108 to see what it was like and then she encouraged me to play her flute and I was I was embarrassed because I hadn't been practicing and I didn't know what I was going to sound like and she just insisted so I picked it up and I played and she said oh the, you are wonderful why are you not playing this is ridiculous so she nudged me and and, and if it had not been for that nudge from her because I think she's quite a great player um, yeah, uh, I also the nudge from your husband. Nudge from my husband, nudge from Vendela, and then when I came home, I said to my husband Paul, I, I said I, I think I want to play again, and he says, well, you should play, and I said, well, I don't have any, anybody to play with, and he said, call Paul, and I said I haven't talked to Paul or spoken to Paul in 21 years, and he said, Google him. You know what I have so heard? I googled him, and I found an email address, and I emailed him. I have heard some wonderful stories about supportive uh, uh, partners. Yeah, it's great. And this is definitely is. one of them. This, uh, oh, a hus he's, he's you know, great. a husband that, that first of all builds you a music room, even when you were saying, you know, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if it's good. Okay, and then sends you, really says, hey, there's this convention, you really want to go? Go. You know? And, and then. He's a real uh, mensch, you know, what we're yeah. saying. He's a mensch. Fabulous. fabulous. Uh, your husband must be a fabulous person okay so you get together you compare notes you do all the history you do, you talk about all the good times and the bad times and then then what how does this and what is the year I'm trying to get a little focus on so this was convention was in August 2014 so the communication between Paul and I by email was yeah let's put it back together and so then we sort of talked you know that fall talked mm -hmm. through what we would do and yeah. you know and January of 2015 he showed up at my house for our first rehearsal week and then he booked a concert for us already in oh, March. That's what I did in March. Yeah. <laughs> was that in your in your neck of the woods yeah I was living in um, in North Carolina uh, then, yeah. at North the Carolina. time 
in the mountains. Well, not quite in the foothills. Uh, and uh, I uh, booked a box lunch. Was it? It was a box lunch hour. Yeah, box, box lunch hour. Bo yeah. Not B O X, but B A C H. Yeah, box. Box. Uh -huh. <laughs> box lunch. And uh, she came out, and uh, I mean, you know. Um, uh, we 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 did uh, old standbys. Well, mm -hmm. You know, we 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 did get a good YouTube recording. I feel uh, pretty good of uh, a piece that Easley Blackwood wrote for us, uh, and, and um, I, I you know I recorded it on video. But um, it was a very very good first concert, and and so it was encouraging. So we said let's let's see what else comes up and. So let's so, compare notes about then and and then, uh, which is to say, in the beginning, the 80s, you're you know sealing envelopes, you're putting stamps on things, you're developing lists, you're doing all, the, all that nightmare. Okay, so then in the new life, how, you both had had that experience. It's very important. When you sat down and said, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to commit to this, it was 2016, yeah, something, 14, 16? 15. So 15. then what, what did you say, oh, and we have the expertise, now we'll, we'll create a database, we'll do, you know, or what? Or was it <laughs> no, no, that was a problem. <laughs> it was huge. There was a huge learning curve for me. Now, you know, Paul never left, he never left music, so I had to get my playing back up, too. My chops had to come back to where they had been. They were, you know, even though we, we played that first concert in March, I wasn't at all confident that I could pull it off. Be, I didn't know if I was going to get stage fright after all those years sure. or, you know, what would happen. And even though musically I knew those pieces, the ones that we did, I knew them inside out. You know, musically it was there, it was all in my head, but, you know, getting my fingers to work and getting all of this to work, I didn't, you know, I didn't know how that was going to be under pressure. It was, it was scary for me that first it is concert. Scary. Uh, I've been there also as a conductor, knew very well the piece. It was a silly thing, a college orchestra rehearsal or something, nothing oh, big. Yeah. And I was terrified. And by yeah. the time, because it had been a couple, three, four years since I had conducted even a, you know, concert band sort of situation, and. Uh, Luckily, I got the wrong day. The, the band room was shut up. But I mean, I had worked myself up into an absolute like nervous wreck. Yeah. <laughs> so believe yeah. me. And by the way, we, we we our anecdotes are not alone, right? Everybody out there watching this, we've all been there. Uh, you know, the yep. audiences, those yep. terrifying moments when you just don't feel quite confident. Okay, but you got through that. Mm. Got through it, and you know, I I took for me, I, I gave myself permission to fail. You know, right before I, you know, I thought, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, I get up there, and I blow it, like I choke and I can't play at all. What will I do at that point? I'll stop and I'll say, Paul, it was always very fond. I, he doesn't even remember this, but he was also he was very fond of saying in the early days he'd say, ha, don't worry about it. It's classical music. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. That's a good one. I must remember that. So yes. So I, I, you know, I said to myself, you know, if if I blow it and I have to stop, we're just going to restart, and I'm going to make that comment. I'm going to say, well, Paul always said, it's classical music. If it was easy, everybody would do it. So we're just going to start again, you know, yeah. and then we start again. But it didn't happen. Everything was fine. It 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 it, went, it was good for a first concert. It, it really was. was. Okay, now I'm going to have to skip ahead a little bit because I can see I'm starting to run out of time. I don't want to go too long, although I have come to the conclusion people watch, they drift away, they can not watch at all, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as you and I have our wonderful talk. So, so time is not so important, but I'm trying to guide it a little bit. We need to talk about the CD. Uh, sure. Okay. <clears throat> Once more, Duo Sequenza. Yes, dot, dot, dot. It's a thing. Uh, this is world premiere recording of new music for flute and classical guitar. Let me just mention the composers, uh, David Noon, Jerry Owen, Mark Mellitz, Amin Sharifi, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, Jorge Muñiz, is it Muñiz with an I, see, I guess? Uh, Muñiz. Yes. Muñiz. Muñiz, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so it's a, it's a mar and let me just give you my little critique, uh, uh, verbal critique, and then later, as you know, I'm going to uh, review the CD, but it, it's a wonderful and very accessible uh, CD of flute guitar repertoire. Some really marvelous uh, pieces, and I know that you you two have been busy. You know, you you are, as part of your whole process, re uh, recording new music. I want to talk about something very important, but, but let's first, uh, ab about maybe the next CD, possibly, we'll talk. Uh, anyway, um, 
so so it's a it's a really very very accessible uh, CD. But what I want to really put out this is like it put out is this is the first CD of the duo, right? Since Wave or, or even ever is this ever the first ever. Well, it's the first commercial release for sure. It's the yeah. first CD for sure. We did do an album back in, I think, 1990. I'm not sure. It was, I mean, but it was that tape. One of those things that spin and you put a needle in it. And it okay. Well, it's the old uh, reel to reel tape and the, or the guy with yeah. his, with his uh, slicing uh, yeah. razor blade to slice the tape just right and spinning the dial. Mm -hmm. er, 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 it's like, don't, there was, there was let's good not go days. there. It was too long ago. <laughs> it was a long time. <laughs> but what's so important yeah. is that you have uh, just, uh, and then let's talk about a couple of the pieces in the few minutes I have here. But the really important thing is the story that we've just spent a lot of time talking about because a lot of people need to hear this, I think, about persistence, about knowing that somehow, you know, this is going to be so, that, that it's an important part of both your lives and then making it happen. So here we are with your first, let's call it your first CD, okay, your okay. first commercial CD. Uh, I salute you right away just for that. Thank little, you. Just Thank for you. that, because you know, I know, we all know who do CDs. That was a two, three year process. Um, well, about two. About two? About, yeah. That, that's enough. <laughs> but it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And, and this is not, uh, well, let's just talk about that. And then be, but before I leave, I want to talk about the glass flute. But first, let's just have a look. I'm just going to kind of browse some of my notes here. Um, <clears throat> there are some beauties on, on this CD. Uh, the, the, uh, the three partitas, the, the David Newman. Piece is marvelous. Preludio, the Musette, uh, the Pastora, uh, Rigadun at four, sorry. Uh, but I put some like 14,000 little X's after Jerry Owens' Mesh Quanawate, this red tailed hawk uh, piece. It's everything that it sounds like it should be in terms of that flute sound, that Native American kind of flute sound, that ethic, composed in 1995. This is really a, a wonderfully thoughtful piece. How, how, how do you guys feel about Jerry Owens' Mesh Kwanawate? We like it a lot. In fact, we like Jerry Owens' music a lot. We're getting ready um, to do a residency with him for 15 days. Turns out he grew up in the Miller Beach area, which is also right on Lake Michigan. It's part of Gary, Indiana. Yeah, so. it's part of Gary, right? And we and we didn't even know this Mishkwanawata, when we found the piece, um, we were looking for Indiana connected composers because in twenty sixteen we did a, a whole three concert series, if you can imagine, three concert series and everything was Indiana connected to celebrate Indiana's wow. bicentennial. Okay. So we were looking for these Indiana connections. And, and I saw that Jerry Owen, when I was doing composer research, he had gone to school in Indiana. He had gone to DePauw in Greencastle. Well, so I wrote to him. He says, yes, dear, that's not my only Indiana connection. I was actually born and raised in Miller Beach, which is, you know, like Paul said, it's right in Gary. It's just a 30 minute drive from where we are. And and he, it turned out he had written, he's written a lot of music for flute classical guitar. And as you heard, he writes beautifully, yeah. genre, beautifully. And um, this piece was never recorded. Yeah. Couldn't believe it. You know, and, and the same thing with the Noon piece. The, that now David Noon's piece, we took that, we toured it all over Asia and Europe back mm -hmm. in our, back in our in first, first iteration and mm. loved, always loved that piece. I actually and, most everything on here. I'm, think, I'm looking at Mark Millips. I've got I got three big checks out of that. Two pieces for flute and guitar from 2000, especially. Well, actually, the the whole thing is uh, uh, the uh, elegy for Lefty is. Oh yeah, gorgeous. It's gorgeous. gorgeous. He sort of reminds you of the second movement of the uh, Concerto de Arnwes. There's mm -hmm. certain the the strum chords, uh, the lush melodies. The yeah, Mark has. Two really, uh, in my view, talents in his guitar writing, and I know his guitar writing from a, a series of, of American folk songs he wrote, uh, did an arrangement of a couple of folk songs, and uh, he he can write these lush guitar chords, 
And then in the first movement, his second his most probably prominent feature is this driving sort of minimalist type of fast Rhythm. Rhythm, rhythmic uh, uh, force, and, and and every time you hear you hear his music, you you just it just is so tight because people are really into it, and it just is very exciting. Uh, it's it's not like Philip Glass or you know it's it's a it's a lot it's a, be a different level. It's a different level of, of of minimalism. It's not quite. I mean, Glass and and Phil and Steve Reich are okay, but I I think Mellitz takes it to a, a whole different level. I really. Yeah, think. it's it is apples and oranges. Uh, if if it we're is. talking about a certain a certain thing called minim, minimalism, I love the driving repetitive rhythm that is contagious. Uh, yes. Sense that, of rhythm. Um, yeah. That's you know, his so, feature, uh, one of his features, and the lush guitar chords uh, in the second movement that uh, accompanied mm -hmm. the, the, the the incredible flute writing. Fruit, flute writing. And how is that writing? Is are you all? Is, did it was it hard to put that piece together? Or, oh uh, yeah. It, well, it, the, the first, first movement, movement is like death by eighth note. You know, <laughs> if you if you drop an eighth note, it's all over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we. Uh, we needed a. You mean clip. fast? I mean, yeah, yeah fast. fast. Yeah. If we do fast. it when we do it live, we we do have click tracks and we have the oh, really? you know, the, the Bluetooth the ear thing, and we'll we'll have it hooked up. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course. You, huh? you because um, it just I I think uh, to have a, a the pulsating eighth note behind you, I, I and. Mark was kind enough to make a, a this demo of the, of the where that listed where the the accents and where the changes in the meter nice. time meters are, and so time you just kind of get used to working with that and then bringing it together, and so we're wearing headphones and or we'll have the Bluetooth thing and we're doing it on stage. It's really comical, but it's kind of necessary. It's just that kind of that we like that extra level of assurance. Huh, that, uh, ver that's very interesting. You have divulged that to me. I will yeah. make a note. Well, we, we experimented even back in our old days with uh, electronics and things. We made a, an arrangement of Ravel's Bolero where I recorded all the parts on the all the various string instruments, mandolin, banjo, electric guitar, acoustic, steel string guitar, classic Lute, guitar. Yeah. She played all the flutes. I played all we, the flutes. We, I did, we just made the parts. And we just played the solo lines on stage with this uh, this amazing orchestration of of, of Bolero us. <laughs> of us on on guitars and flutes, and we, we we did that. So it's it, you know the electronics is, is is the way of the future. You know, playing uh, I've done a lot of electronic acoustic electric things, and uh, but this this requires a, a click track in my view until. Unless we, we go out and tour it and play it a hundred times. <laughs> we might get it right without... Well, that's very, that's very... 100 performances would fix another it. Another hundred performances. 100 it. live performances. Well, that's a very, a very, uh, very revealing, a very interesting uh, little trick yep. that you've just disclosed. Uh, I mean, Sharifi, I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the name again properly, uh, duets exhibition I mean this 2016 piece now we're pushing uh, the CD gets closer and closer to the, the here and now 2016 um, how what do we have one two three four we got four, four. little little wonderful miniatures. pleasant beautiful little miniatures thank you very much murdered in his labyrinth I remember is that is the last on that set so clearly a narrative of some kind and, and that's what's intriguing when composers can grab grab the listener and bring them into a narrative even if the listener is going I, I know that there are the stories going on here but I don't know what uh, well, that's the thing with this piece he decided that he'll throw all kinds of poetry art anything and it doesn't matter it's just expression ah. so he had no he had no message he had no artistic idea he just wanted he just called it all expression mm -hmm. And the things that that inspired him to write it, write the, the the movements are all based on different things. There's a James Joyce 
uh, a quote that he's doing. There's the first movement with these paintings and, and so on. And it, it, there's no relation to it. It's right. just it's just art for art's sake. Uh -huh. that, that's yeah. kind of mm -hmm. his view. And, and 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 you know that's that's how he wrote it. Was was he's gonna. Uh, not have a connection at all to the material that he's inspired by. Right. Yeah. And that is very exactly. interesting. I, I, you know, he's yeah. not the first composer, but it's, it's certainly so interesting be inspired. That, that it, and quite deliberate, you know, that yeah. he's making that kind of choice. Uh, I'm running rapidly uh, beyond oh. time, so I, I, but I can't let this conversation end without discussing Jorge Munoz's uh, South Shore Suite because South Shore is your neck of the woods. Yes? Right. Kind of our signature piece, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the signature piece. Let me just run by the movements a little bit, just the names, and then you can kind of give us all an overview of South Shore, where, what that is. I'm in California, South Shore. Hmm. Okay, uh, Princess Mishawaka, I presume that's a, a legendary princess from the, the, the Midwest uh, lands and, and Native Americans. Uh, Mount Baldy, Lake Michigan. Diana of the Dunes. There's got to be a story there. Uh, and by the way, blow, blowing the tune over the mouthpiece, that wonderful whispering sound. I love, love that. Diana of the Dunes. And then Dillinger's Run. And then Epilogue, <laughs> Chicago. Tell both of you live in that stretch of the country. Yeah, nearby, right? This is that's the south shore of Lake Michigan. Yeah, that's south, that's literally where, where Paul grew up. And it's a metaphorical journey. On that, mm. on that train between South Bend and Chicago. And these are just some of the iconic landmarks or legends of the region that the composer chose. We didn't, we didn't, we just said we wanted a piece kind of connected to the dunes, connected to the South Shore of Lake Michigan, you know, and, and we wanted it to be multi-movement work. Um, other than that, we didn't give him any real Parameters. So you, you commissioned this piece, did you? Yes, we you commissioned did. it for the, again for Indiana Indiana's bicentennial in 2016. Uh -huh. But he got all the inspiration. He was daily riding the train uh, from South Bend or Mishawaka, where he lives. He's a professor, at IU South Bend, uh, he, to Chicago. He had a little uh, apartment, and he would hole himself up because he had a an, he had opera, an opera to write uh, to write and a big commission. And so, so he was getting ideas at the same time for our piece during his uh, travels on the South Shore uh, commuter train. And by the and, way, it just, it just occurred to me, I have a friend who lives in South Bend, not, not a, a friend, but a woman that joined me on a trip to Cuba about three summers ago. And this very day, this is what I love about Facebook, She has, she's babysitting her nieces and nephews or something, the train ride, from South Bend to Chicago, to, she took oh. the kids into Chicago. So I mean, I, and I thought about that. She today. took the South Shore, Dan. That's she how the she took the train. And she took. She took the South and, Shore. And, and she's mentioned it before. Yep. Just that the idea of going into Chicago from South Bend, and sure enough, that's the, that's obviously the the, tr the yep. route that so many millions of people know. So they people will rem will instant. Oh, Mount Baldy! I remember seeing Mount Baldy from out the window. Is that kind of thing how 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 much you say this is your signature piece just because it's south shore i mean i think because it's yeah it i mean it's you know it's the same it's the region where we're, we're based it's yeah. tied yeah. to this region yeah. yeah by the way one other thing and then, then we have to leave this will be the longest one so so far so we'll oh, see I, I need to offer rewards for people that, that sit through the whole thing. <laughs> uh but and, but and and let me just reassure you people love the videos. The videos are very, very important. People, uh, uh, viewers get very, very engaged. So, so far, I haven't had any complaints, but, but we're going to end it. I promise everybody. Uh, but what I, what I want to know is a little something about careers, uh, ambitions, home, a sense of place. In other words, some people, I talk to a lot of them, are 100%, you know, high active, um, big careers in the big cities and their the energy is, you know, intense and all of that. Others, I live in Santa Barbara, I'm pretty mellow my, myself, frankly, uh, but others make choices. You two have made a choice, have you not, to live happily in this part of Indiana, make music in your region for your people for your community. Have I got that right? And of course you're going to do a little traveling, well, a little touring, but. Right. Well, Paul's in South Carolina. That's where he's living. Oh, I keep time. forgetting. So right, we just hear right. 
really but my whole theory. In terms of, well, in terms of the art, though, and, and the culture, I think where he's living in Spartanburg, they have a very well-established arts audience and musical music audience, and there's a lot of culture that's there. In this region where I'm living and where he grew up, we don't have it. It's not that well established. Um, it's kind of gone by the wayside a little bit um, in recent years, and we would like to we would like to see this area develop more as a cultural destination. You know, it has these neat geographical features. We just the Indiana Dunes has just been named a national park. It's our nation's 61st national park right here. It's right where Paul grew up. It's it's a 15 minute drive from my house. And so we, you know, we think it's a destination. This area is a destination and and we want to see it be a cultural destination. And we've always been about like connecting to audiences. That's just kind of been our shtick. And there's something about what most of us uh, take for for granted. I'm a Spokane boy. <clears throat> so Spokane's a pretty decent sized city. You know, it's yeah. not a big city. Yeah. It, and it has, excuse me, <coughs> it has those brick buildings still. Mm -hmm. And that my fantasy uh, has always been about the Midwest and the little towns with the brick buildings, you know, from the turn of the last century, from the 19 teens. And so, so I'm charmed, at least in my head, I'm charmed already by just the idea of what the Midwest is. Flat, oh, we, we were towns. playing uh, regularly in a uh, opera house that was built oh, in 18... 1893. Well, they just had the, their 125th anniversary, so yeah. we'd have to do the math. But yeah, it's like, I think they're 100. 25th. Every, you know, yeah, 25 years these, buildings, these, these buildings are all over the place in little yeah. towns all over the Midwest. And we must all remember that the Midwest boomed at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Big cities. These Muncie, uh, you know, Oshkosh. These were all going to be the great, great cities of the of the world. You know, so so there's that remnant. These incredible buildings, beautiful antiques. It reminds me of uh, New England. Uh, wonderful little opera houses in every little little town. So, but but it, so the point is well taken. You of course go have you have your job job, Paul. So you go back to, to uh, South is it South Carolina? Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is your home zone, and so you're connected to it. And when you can, oh, you're here. So there is a there is a function. Yeah. yeah, I have family here. I mean, it's uh, it's still home. And this will be retirement. Yeah, when the time comes. <laughs> Who's yeah, it? Why are you yet? retiring? Who's retiring? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I realized I was in trouble the minute I said that because I'm thinking, hey, I'm 71. I'm not, you know, yeah. they're going to they're gonna take me kicking and screaming to the nursing home. I know. I, I think I like the winters in South Carolina better than uh, the up north. Yeah. Well yeah. spoken. Uh, there's, a, there's from a true Indiana. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they can be a little harsh here. I mean, very, yeah. Yeah, they can be a lot harsh here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot harsh. Okay. A lot harsh. Well, there was there were several days there where the, our temperature, our air temperature, was closer, clo colder than the air temperature in Alaska. And it just got really, really cold here. That's harsh. Okay, That's enough harsh. of this. Uh, climate is indeed changing. I have had a great talk. We're going to have to end a wonderful talk uh, with flutist Deborah Silbert uh, and guitarist Paul Bowman. We did not have a chance to speak about your glass flute, but oh, give me a... Give me a quick date, and is this maybe something about another CD coming up? Tell me a little bit about the glass flute. It is, working on. it is, it is, it is. It's an 1816 four-keyed lead crystal flute made by Claude Laurent in Paris. And, um, yeah, very, very rare. There's only about 150 of these existing in the world. About 40 of them are privately held, and there's only four people that own them and actually play on them publicly, although... Somebody just posted a YouTube video. Um, I, I think he, but I think the flute that he's playing belongs to a museum. I'm not sure about that, but he's an excellent player, Peter Bloom. Question? Yes. Am I wrong, or do I remember that your husband? Your yeah. Husband involved. Hello. He Tell bought us. it. He bought it for me. Um, we went to Washington D.C. to see a flute, the Dayton C. Miller flute collection at the Library of Congress back in 1987, and I fell in so in love with the 17 Claude Laurent crystal flutes that they have there. It's the largest collection of them in one place in the world. One of them is President James Madison's crystal flute. Yeah. And um, my husband said, I'm going to get you one someday. 
So it took him well over, well, it took him about a decade. What a match. Yeah, about a decade. What a match. Well, over a decade. I think it was about 12 years. But he put feelers out with antique flute dealers all over the world and or people who dealt in antique musical instruments and said he wanted to buy one and of those. Are you, uh, are you looking at maybe making use of this glass flute on a wonderful, very special CD? Yes. In the future? Yeah. Really, it's about raising money yeah. and paying the, you know. Yeah, we had one piece that we commissioned for it already. It will be it'll be new music for this old flute. Gary Shocker. Gary Shocker wrote a piece for us already. Uh, yes. Right, and we're gonna call it. I think we're gonna call it. Yes, it's a fragile thing. Ah, that's a beautiful idea. That's a great idea. And by the way, I've seen the pictures because the picture of the flute is on your website. Uh, right. Yes. So, Check it out. and I'm gonna, as you know, I'm gonna point everybody at your website and everything. Whenever you uh, put anything up of interest on Facebook, I will share it with everyone under the sun. I promise I'll, I'll have a review of the CD, but do not hold your breath. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> okay. not, I'm that far behind. I'm not holding my breath. That's for sure. But the point is, it's fine because I'll throw out a whole new batch of publicity when when I get the review up. So you know, exactly. it's win-win. Uh, Deborah Silver, guitarist Paul Bowman, many, many thanks for uh, giving some giving me some time there in Indiana, Valparaiso, Indiana, uh, and you're doing good things for both yourselves and for your community. Hello. I think that's important. So I'm glad you shared this story with us. Very, very important. Many thank thanks. You. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye.